my name is Thomas Johnson, and I'm here because of the asteroid crater and Serpent Mound. It all started when I was collecting fossils up in Northern Ohio and met some doctors from Wilmington and they said, you need to come to Southern Ohio because there's bigger trilobites here. So in 1978, I quit my job at General Motors and moved to Southern Ohio. And in 1985, I ran into some folks from the Smithsonian and they were buying specimens for a new gallery that they were going to build in 1990. So they came to Ohio and they come in and I laid out 1,500 specimens of trilobites, which a lot of them are here in these galleries. I said, so which ones do you want? And they went to lunch and came back and said, can we have the whole collection? So I said, okay, so I loaned it to them for 25 years. In the meantime, I was doing uh, this research at Caesar Creek Lake and they said, hey, you know, you need to find out where the first examples of this state fossil was found, the Isotelus. And it was here in Adams County. So I'm going through the literature and, and here's a thing by Dr. John Locke in 1832. And he came here in a covered wagon and he went to this little stream and he found these big trilobites. So I came here and I'm standing in a creek on somebody else's land and the landowner drives by and he just happens to see me standing in his creek. He turns around and comes back and reads me the riot act for trespassing. And I told him my story, what I was doing. He was sympathetic to it and he says, would you like to buy this land? And I said, well, I don't have any money. And they said, I'll sell you whatever you want here for $100 a month on a land contract. And I ended up with 22 acres of trilobites for $100 a month. So I'm sitting down there in, in this land 12 miles south of here, and uh, my ex-wife, who was into Egyptology, was going to Egypt constantly. And they said, you know where Serpent Mound is? And of course, we say, yeah. And well, we need pictures of it. So we drive past this house in the middle of the winter, and the for sale sign is out. And I always liked this house because they were it was run down. They're refurbishing it. The guy that actually bought the house said, I can't live here because it's haunted. And of course, he didn't tell me that when I bought it, but I found out later why he wouldn't live here. <laughs> so I ended up buying the property and opening this rock shop. And because it's on a good intersection, just three miles from Serpent Mount, I it's a good location. So as soon as I open up the rock shop, two guys from NASA show up. Hal Provamir was one of them. And uh, he wrote a book on tektites are from space or from the moon. Tektites are just, uh, something that is a result of an asteroid impact making a glass. And he said, do you know where this crater is? And I thought, well, you mean the crypto explosion structure? He goes, yeah, that one. He says, I'm looking for Breccia. So uh, I told him where to go and he took off. Two years later, they found the particle that they were looking for. It was a little tiny particle, the diameter of a human hair. It's an actual micro quartz crystal and it has a little facing across it or a shock feature. And they found that, and now it's been designated as a crater as of 1998. And so the, the crater actually predate the Appalachian Mountains, which were formed during the Permian period 250 million years ago. So we're, we're thinking that the crater is, uh, it could be anything from 255, 260 million, maybe to 300 million. The crater is so large. I mean, it's small in the scale of things as far as astroblems go. But this crater, you can't really witness it from the ground in, in just standing in one spot, except if you're at the Locust Grove Cemetery. It's high enough vantage point. You can overlook, you can see the central uplift. You can see all the rims that are visible. You can get an idea of the scope of it. It's a very large crater. So it's a good vantage point as far as, you know, looking at the geography. Now, the only other way you could view that is to get up in space or, you know, get way up in a plane to see that. So that's a vertical uplift where the asteroid hit, the shockwave went down, came back up, lifted the crest of the earth and stood it vertical. And as you look to the north beyond that, you see Fort Hill. And Fort Hill is eight miles from here. And if you follow around to the right, you see a high ridge here, that's the Appalachian Mountains. And then the rim of the crater is just inside the Appalachian Mountains. And if you come off that come off that ridge about halfway off, you'll see some low-lying hills. They're just barely visible. That's the eastern rim of the crater. And uh, it follows around to the south, right here by Locust Grove. And you can see where it dips off. It kind of makes a bowl. Even after 250 million years, it's still visible. So we're looking at this. It's about a mile away from here. It's right in that area. And there's a cut in that tree line, if you can see that little cut there. 
That's just where Serpent Mound is. That's the western rim of the crater. So to see the whole crater, you kind of have to pan across. It's five miles. And you have to imagine, back when this happened, the sea bottom was a mile above us. So for 250 million years, we've had dry land erosion, and it's just been cut down and cut down. But the crater is still visible, if you know what you're looking at. Now, if we swing around to the south, what we call that the ghost rim of the crater. So even though today we have a crater that's five miles wide, it was much larger at one time. So there's a fault line that runs down Route 41 from the center of the crater, and right there where the ghost rim is, is in the curve just in front of the Wickerham Tavern. And when it rains and it pours, it always pours on the south side of that line where the ghost rim is, and on this side it's dry. It's all weather related. So there's still an energy that's going around. We drove out towards Serpent Mound and uh, went through the southern rim of the crater and we ended up in Loudoun, which is on the western rim. And from Loudoun, we had a good vantage point of looking at the uplift. And from there, you're two and a half miles away instead of three and a half miles away at the cemetery. We're basically on the very edge of the western rim here. And we're looking out to the east and two and a half miles exactly is Parker Ridge. So that's your point of impact. Magnetic anomalies follow the rim, so they affect weather. That's the first thing that I noticed about this actually being a crater, was how it affected weather, because anytime you get a fault system or magnetic anomalies, they will neutralize cloud bases, cumulonimbus, highly charged clouds. So it, the negative energy neutralizes the positive energy in the cloud base. And uh, so storms are weakened as they come through. And most of the time it bounces off the rim and goes to the south or goes to the north, but it just opens up and goes around. And then I started talking to the local farmers and they're saying that the crop yield inside the crater is about half of what it is outside the crater. It's like night and day because they don't get the precipitation. So it's a whole different environment inside of the crater. And then from there, we circled back around by Serpent Mound, and we went on a little road called Horner Chapel. And Horner Chapel goes right through an area of a bedrock called the Breccia. And the Breccia is a rock that has been blasted apart and reconstituted with the ingredients of the asteroid. So you have all these rare elements here. You've got the chromium minerals. You've got cobalt, chromium, nickel, iridium, and then the iron and zinc was here naturally from the dolomite exposure. So well, now we're about a mile and a half away from the uplift, which is right there. And what we're standing on is rock that's been pulverized by the blast, and it's called breccia. And within this breccia, there's a white calcite here. And this rock is uh, got properties, it's actually phosphorescent. So the only place in the state of Ohio where you can find this stuff is right here and you'll put a black light on it and there'll be little blue dots in there that will glow after you turn the light off. So it's kind of neat. And as you can see, it's, it has different colors in it. So this is all particles of rock that have been blasted apart by the impact. And when it impacted, the asteroid vaporized and it went ahead in, in what they call siderophile elements into this rock. So the only way you can measure them was like a mass spectrometer. And so it's all cemented back together. And then if you, if you were to look at this under high magnification, each one of these particles is very sharp. So it's, it's not, uh, wasn't made due to erosion. It was not subjected to that. It happened instantaneously. So this rock was blasted out, fell back in, reconstituted and turned into a rock. And it's fairly soft. Okay, but when this happened, this rock, you could not do that to it. You'd need a hammer to break it, but you can actually take and break it apart with your hands. That's how soft it is. So it has cobalt, chromium, nickel, iridium, iron, and zinc. So the smoking gun is basically iridium and the chromium minerals. But this goes down 6,000 feet in the ground, and it surrounds the entire uplift of the crater. So it was a bowl, imagine a bowl a mile deep with the rock standing vertical in the center, and then everything around it was pulverized a mile deep. So over the millions of years, it's been filling in. 
but at one time it was just a crater. Then from there we backtracked and we went over to the northeastern rim of the crater up towards Sinking Spring. So we saw a house that was built on top of a conical mound. In back of us as we were standing there, we were actually standing on rock 350 million years old that had slid down off the eastern escarpment and filled the floor of the crater in. So the uniqueness of the crater is you can stand on something that's 350 million years old and above you is rock that's 438 million years old and geologically that's impossible unless you're in an asteroid crater. And there's magnetic anomalies all the way down Route 73 all the way up to Serpent Mound. And those magnetic anomalies are created by the displacement of rock within the crater from the blast. And you have to picture 100 million years of strata, almost a mile deep, that has been displaced by an impact. And you have to understand that each layer of the Paleozoic bedrock, the sea bottom, each layer has its own signature, a magnetic signature in it. Of course, the continents are moving constantly, so you're gonna get a different reading in each layer of rock as to where north is. So when you displace those alignments, you get a magnetic anomaly. And when you multiply that times a mile deep, you get a lot of magnetic anomalies. And the magnetic anomalies affect weather patterns, they affect cars, they affect people, computers. The second point that we went to where there was a crossroads was actually the central uplift of the crater on top Parker Ridge. And there is where the fault line goes through. And there's a fault line deep in the Earth. And it's the only place on Earth where an asteroid has hit a fault. And there's a constant flow of energy coming out of the ground there. And it affects, like I say, it affects the weather. It affects cars. We've had people park cars up there and their door locks will lock on them automatically. That's why I said take the keys out of your car. <laughs> and, and sometimes you get weak of the knees when you get out of the car. It just depends on when it is. It's not a constant flow that affects everything, but sometimes it's strong enough where it actually affects people. Where we are right now, we're on the uplift, and this is a shatter cone. So in place, this rock was actually in place like this on the sea bottom. And when the asteroid hit, it went down through a thousand feet of bedrock and actually hit a little fossil here. It's called a raphnosquina, it's a brachiopod. And that shellfish was laying in the sea bottom. 438 million years later, an asteroid hits, travels a thousand feet through solid bedrock and hits that brachiopod and goes around it. So that's proof that energy takes the path of least resistance. It's physical, it's not just a theory. It's actually there. So that's the shock wave. This rock here is bedded in Cincinnati at the Ohio River, exact same formation, exact same fossils. And there's a thousand feet difference between here and Cincinnati. So that kind of puts it in place or in perspective. And there's another shatter cone right there. And that shatter cone was produced by when the shock wave, this is the first initial blast went down and as it was coming back up, it made another shock wave. So this is just a classic example of a shatter cone. And uh, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just amazing to hold something like this to think that that energy had traveled down that deep into the Earth's surface through stratified rock. It actually went down about 6,000 feet. So all the rocks in the core drills that were taken uh, by the energy companies back in the 60s when they were looking for chromium minerals uh, exhibit these in their, in their core drills. So that, that's the interesting part about the uplift. And then of course you have the fault line that goes through the uplift. And, and this fault line crosses, it starts 17 kilometers north, they call the Greenfield Fault. It goes all the way down through the crater and right here at Parker Ridge it tees off so there's like the, the fault line goes through here and then it tees off and it goes towards Serpent Mound. So it's energizing Serpent Mound, plus it goes all the way down past the front of our house on Route 41. It's the only place on Earth where an asteroid has hit a fault line. And that makes this area unique. So this, this rock is at the very top, but it came from a thousand feet below and was justed up on a rebound shock wave and stood vertical. So that's called the central uplift. So that's the oldest part of the crater is the highest part of the crater. And then if you go down into the floor of the crater, 
there at Woodland Altars and along Route 41, you have a rock that's anywhere from 320 million to 350 million years. And that rock slid down from the eastern slope of the crater millions of years ago and filled the bottom of the crater in where there was a void. And so when geologists came here, like uh, Mr. John Locke back in 1832, who did a survey of the crater, when he surveyed that, he said this whole area is upside down because geologically it's impossible to stand on a rock that's 320 million years old and reach out and touch, physically touch something that's 425 million because the whole rim of the crater is 425 million. Then the upper part is Ordovician, which is 438 million. So you have the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, and the Mississippian rocks, 100 million years of displacement within that crater. The other interesting part about the crater is, and all around, people will park cars in parking lots at Serpent Mound, up and down the different roads in, in the crater, and their batteries will be automatically or immediately drained of energy. And I'm talking about new cars, cars that have no problems with them. And the towing service will go out and they'll, they'll give them a jump and they say, there's nothing wrong with your alternator. It's perfectly fine. You're in a crater. So there's these things that are in the ground that are actually affecting machines, if you will. And uh, back several years ago, uh, we were going to have a big conference here with uh, Reynolds, the Kahuna. And just before that happened, a derecho came out of Chicago. Straight line winds came through this area. We were all sitting on the porch, and when those winds came through 90 miles an hour, they were snapping off trees, and the power line that goes to our house melted in front of our very eyes. It just lit up and melted. And the power company came out days later, because we didn't have any power. They did a survey, and they said, you're on a fault line. Well, what's that have to do with it? Well, American Electric Power stated that the wind had picked up the ground energy off of Route 41 from the fault line and built it up on that line going across and melted it. So the power company knows about this. So there's these features around here that they're hidden, but yet they're visible. And it affects, like I say, it affects the weather. When you see storms sweeping across the area, when they hit the western edge of the crater, they'll get neutralized and they slide back around this way. So it's, it's very visible. The impact created the hole, of course, and then the ledge that Serpent Mound sits on, that prominence is made out of dolomite, and it, it weathers slowly. It's not a fast weathering material, but when the glacier came in uh, 600,000 years ago, it actually stopped at that ledge, and it was an ice sheet about, a, I figure, about a mile high, and uh, it eroded part of that ledge away, and it collapsed into Brush Creek and those boulders have been sitting there for that long because they can't be moved by Brush Creek. It's not a big enough stream to move them. And the underwater serpent, what we call the underwater serpent, sits in an orientation to the northwest, exactly the same way the prominence that Serpent Mound sits on and the head of the serpent is facing. But you look at these rocks that are here and they're way too big for the Brush Creek to push them. So they're all just sitting here as they came off of this ledge when it collapsed. And you look at the, the way the rock is bedded. See the angle of it? It's been pushed. Mm -hmm. So it's got a slight, you know, dip to it. Well, quite a, actually a large dip. If you're standing here and somebody's at the head of the Serpent Mound talking on that overlook, you can hear them. They're 1,360 feet away. So it's really good acoustics here, trap sound. But you can imagine coming up this river thousands of years ago and seeing that. And pareidolia just means that you can see an image in something. You know, you can imagine something. Like you pick up a rock and you say, oh, that's a turtle or that's a serpent. That's pareidolia. So half of the population has that. So you can imagine if they saw that and you go, whoa, look at that. <laughs> And there's a, uh, up near the head of the serpent is the big obelisk that Ross talks about. Of course, that's covered up now. That was covered up by the state. Yeah, they made a footpath over top of it. As soon as they talked about it, they went down and covered it up. I, I think the landscape is, is very important to this area. And one being 
the undulations of the river, the superhighway, just like Serpent Mound. They didn't have to build Serpent Mound the way they did. They could have done it much differently, but they, they chose to make it undulating, which would speak to the river. The prominence that it sits on, when you go north of it and look back at that prominence, it's an 80-foot high serpent on the landscape. So that's, that's another thing. And then the other thing is, of course, the underwater serpent, facing the same direction as the head of the serpent towards summer solstice sunset and the fact that it looks just like the head of a serpent. So those three things, when you look at it, you'd say, aha, this is the good spot. Plus you have protection from storms. But that would have to take observation of years where actually building Serpent Mount could have happened rather quickly. But the, the fact that somebody actually observed and lived there and said, this is a cool place to live, yeah. The storms are going around us, they're not coming through. That, that add, that's added protection. And when you're living outside, you have to look at things like that. My, my contribution is just enlightening people yeah. and teaching and trying to inspire people to, to carry on and, and pursue it because it's an endless study. If I, had, I, I wish I had 400 more years because I got a lot of work to do, but I know I'm just going to have to train people like the kids and the grandkids and hopefully the great grandkids and go out and pick up and keep working and doing things like this. That's important to make a record. And even if it's not written, I mean, I do write some, but it, it's nice to pass it along this way. It reaches more people.